what the dilemma is what um what do you focus on when you're going to work, work on a play or work on whatever what are you focusing your particular reality you know so if, so 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 i have a, a piece for example where i have a white character in it it's an epic piece it's a large piece mm -hmm. A very nice white guy, actually. He's a very nice guy. He's a, in this particular community in the South. He is a part. He is. He, he is the. He runs the whole little village, you might say. Mm -hmm. But he's like a member of the family of all the folks he, that, who work for him. So he's a nice guy. But he did something wrong with his own people. That had, in a spiritual sense, in, was weighted in such a way. It was a violation cosmically. He has to die. Mm. There's nothing more. That's all there is to it. He's not, an, and not angry with him. He's some, they like him. He's a nice guy. But he's in the end of this piece, he has got to go. He's got to give up his body, and his spirit has to move on. And every major white theater who looks at this, they think the play is absolutely brilliant and extraordinary, but they always turn it down because they cannot serve that to their subscribe, subscription base of a white guy dying like that. But what you're saying is that, isn't that almost like, uh, since you come from that, that, that world, isn't that the black arts movement thing also, you, do, do, do white people had to die? <laughs> to no, die. well, no, I don't, I don't take it quite, quite like I that. Mean, I'm, I'm saying that's what they're thinking. Because oh, they're, they're thinking to you're black, you know, the white guy's got to die. It has nothing to do with it. It has to do with, in, the case of my, in my case, he's positioned in a context whereby in terms of this, the spiritual forces that, go, that take over, even however nice he is, he has to give up his body and his spirit, his spirit move on. Well, uh, Paul He's Carter, the guy that has to die. Well, Paul Carter Harrison, let, let, let me say this. When I write plays, when I used to write plays a lot, I never wrote for the play. I always wrote for a space. I can't explain it. I saw a space and I started writing for the space. So these plays weren't really me. It was like me channeling whatever the universe was pushing through. And I, that's just how they turned out. Mm -hmm. But let me get into that kind of, uh, um, I want to say aesthetic. And this is my major question to you and I want to get it out first. Uh, in, in, the, in the Harlem Renaissance, you had, you know, you had people like Elaine Locke would have giving criticism and, and, and people, you know, going off of that. And, 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 and then say from the early, the late 40s, early 50s on through basically the black arts movement or the, the, the beginning of the 60s, you really didn't have or we didn't know of, of, of um, someone giving that kind of criticism or critique or, or aesthetic like that. Then the 60s came along and then, you know, you had people like Larry Neal or whatever have you giving that aesthetic. Now, I guess you're in that, yeah, um, I, in, in, in that thing now. I'm, my, my, I'm sorry. Go on. My, my major question is, so I see, I see the Renaissance, then this gap, then th then the '60s, right? And now I see another. I'll say gap, but now this day there is no there is no uh, critics critics or aesthetics that shapes the body. Now, am I right with it? Well, just just riff on that if you can. Oh, it's very, it's, I, was, uh, I mean, you said it very clearly. I mean, it's just like. Uh, the, um, there was the Renaissance, uh, which uh, tried to identify in certain respects Africa, at least Alan, Elaine Locke, as a repository of information that should fuel what we do artistically, even though the Renaissance was directed toward the Harmon Foundation. And so they actually performed aesthetically in ways that were accepted by the white establishment. Right. So that was the Renaissance. Exactly. And 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 with the uh, Aaron Douglas, of course, and a few other people, would would depart from that slightly. But basically, the Renaissance was the first acknowledgement that black people had the skill to do artwork, painting, dancing, you know, to do it in a very professional way. That was an acknowledgement. Come this black arts movement, Larry Neal says. You must jettison all of those particular values that belong to the Western tradition. You must jettison it. And that means that you must then, we as African people, and he meant people, not just simply African Americans, must have our own iconology, or pursue our own iconologies, our own uh, uh, symbology, and, and, and very, very importantly, our own critique. The critique that you make on your condition. 
so that everybody else defines what your particular condition is and tell you, as a black person, what your response should be, including the civil rights movement. is a kind of a, well, that's a, a, a noble response, your protest, but it has nothing to do with how you see yourself in that, real, in that reality. <clears throat> so the black arts movement was trying to get people to, to start to redefine themselves. <clears throat> And thus began to create a new aesthetic, a new way of, of looking at the work. Now, uh, and then they called it, foundationally, they called it black art. Mm. By this period we're in right now, I ask myself, well, what is black art? Uh, you, oh, you mean colored art. art, people of color art, or the black experience art, the journalistic replication of black life. That's what you're talking about, that's black art? Just because you have a black person in the picture? I said, when you have black people on the stage, does that mean it's black art? To me, no. And it, unless you can find inside of that work something that signifies a different way of looking at those characters, a different way of looking at the space you're in, how do you manipulate the space, what are the particular devices that are being used to make that <clears throat> artistically something uh, other than the Western tradition. Okay, now I want to get to that, but let me go back. I want to. Okay, let's let's do the gap first. I, I <clears throat> I've identified at least well at least one gap. Well, I don't think it was a gap. You know, what, I think it's a happening? transition. It's a constant transition. The one that we're, we're right now, you speak of a gap. For example, the, 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 this no, this uh, right now, this you might call it a gap. I mean, the hip hop thing is signifying on some of the stuff that happened in the Black Horse movement. It's, it's a not, remix. They're remixing. They're, they're remixing some of the stuff, but it's not, it's, it's not, it doesn't have any real place to go. I mean, it, it doesn't, it's not landing anywhere. It's, in fact, what it is doing is uh, separating uh, people from the um, sustained um, appreciation, appreciation and understanding of what their own cultural uh, syntax might be if you want to be a performing artist or or painter etc you know uh, in other words they're moving into a pop cultural mode they, 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 they're now you know they're part of uh, a rolling stone and that that kind of thing they're not you know it's not very really, I mean the hip-hop movement has, certainly has the attention of the young black people in the world and certainly they have in this country in America uh, the hip-hop movement has made has created a, a whole new way of being in the American world, you might say, mm. without necessarily saying you're black. Mm. And in a very kind of funny way. I mean, you know, Jay-Z, Beyonce, all of that, you know. I mean, they, they try, actually, the Beyonce tries to do <clears throat> some things that have signifying gestures toward black cultural interests, etc. But for the most part, the, um, I, I see it as a kind of, a, these funny little transitions uh, one of the things I think, even in hip hop, that might be, and this might sound contradictory, but it's not necessarily. In this transition, I'm noticing hip hop music at least becoming more social conscious. They're beginning to in introduce into those rhythms and those quote unquote beats uh, a kind of. Uh, uh, signifying on the social conditions of African American people. Some would argue that it started that way and it <clears throat> quickly derailed exactly. and now it's coming back to right. their beginning. Right, right. In other words, it's not concerned with all of this misogynistic kind of language and, and you know, it, it's, you know, they, they are now moving more toward looking at what it is that's the pulse of the African American experience as opposed to like the description of it, you know, the high the high life or the low life. <laughs> and of course we're talking about the, the we're not talking about the underground hip hop movement who's always stayed where they they've stayed. Uh, we're talking about the popular movement. The popular movement itself, right. Yeah. Let me go I, I need to go back because we need to get some grounding here of Paul Carl Harrison and, and we we let me go back again to the sixties. Now again I put you in the same the same level as, as the Larry Neal or whatever uh, as, as shaping the aesthetic the, uh, give me your riff on that because for instance uh, Larry <coughs> there was a whole thing a whole thing about uh, having a being a black play you know I, his last the piece in fact we did an audio drama of uh, Glorious Monster and the Bell of the Horn it's like a, um, uh, it was like the, pers the, the personification of the black arts movement what it stands for can you talk a little bit about that and, and, and your, and your well, role look, in that kind I of I mean scene? It's, uh, you know, Larry and I were very close as you might very well know we, we, we uh, 
you know, I mean, uh, he was, uh, I lived in Europe for a long time and I came back, he was the first person that, that I latched on to when I got back and, and we then spent week upon weeks upon weeks talking about the aesthetics of black art, painting, writing, all of it. In Belly of the Horn, <coughs> He starts off with the me with the metaphor of the horn, and 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 you know the, the whole kind of the notion of of uh, I mean, particularly the tenor horn uh, being the repository of a whole life and a life force. So he's dealing already uh, in, 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 a, in a symbolic way. Uh, <clears throat> references to uh, uh, Africanity. Just by talking about that, that horn as a character in the piece, which is not was not it was not he was not dealing. He separated himself from this realistic this realism, which po makes portraits of black behavior, and 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 you're supposed to do a psychological examination or a sociological examination, and that's it. No, he was moving from the symbolic inside of that, then the, and of course the music. The introduction of music without having it being a musical, where music then becomes a character also. Mm -hmm. The horn is a symbolic reference, or oh, by the repository of, 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 of certainly uh, um, the, 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 the richness of the cultural life of black people, you might say. So, yes, uh, what, what I've been doing, let me, let me see if I can help you here. What I have been doing the last 30 years, ever since Larry mm -hmm. passed, <coughs> Excuse me. I've been working on <clears throat> the critical vocabulary. What is the critical vocabulary? How do we talk about these things? What language do we use to talk about it? If we're going to use the traditional Western language uh, um, to to examine what it is we're doing, then we're still locked in to to uh, their, their critical devices and their, their explanation of what we do, and we explain ourselves through their particular language, you have to have another language. Or at the, or at the worst, you're actually reacting to that. So it's well, so, 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 so you, you, forces you into reacting because you're using that language. So, so they'll say, what is the dramatic arc? What is, uh, where, uh, what is the, um, uh, where does the, um, how do you call it, um, what is the denouement? What is the, well, how does it resolve oh. itself? Uh, you start using these kind of values to look at your experience. That means you got to have a beginning, a middle, and an end. You know, you got to have that particular way of looking at it. But yet we have Charlie Parker. This is what Larry would tell you. We have a Charlie Parker. We have a Thelonious Monk. We have a Mingus in our midst who are not producing music in the convention of the Western logic. They're producing, uh, we have a, a Cecil Taylor and a Julius Hemphill. Mm. Uh, 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 all these musicians, the magic, uh, uh, Larry used to refer to them as the, the magicians, not the musicians, mm -hmm. were the first ones to set out a language, uh, 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 a music language, a stylization that showed we did not re require those same kind of sh shapes and contours of, let's say, traditional Western music. Uh, we understand the value of a flatted fifth, or the value of just simply the, the, the shifts in tonics to create tension and angularity. Mm -hmm. Then the poets came on their heels, and the poets then began, the black poets then began to riff inside of that. They, Leroy Jones or uh, Mary Barak, if you like, well, my, my favorite, of course, is uh, Henry Dumas, but... Well, of course, I mean, he got up to Henry Dumas, so he, uh, not just in the mix, but he was a leading figure. Uh, uh, but everyone, I mean, the style, though, I think, was set up by Baraka. In other words, from the 50s, already he was into this thing, was, was moving the voice through the music and becoming an instrument in the process. In other words, the voice then becomes just the instruments, the notes of the instrumentation and the voice of the poet become all orchestrated as one thing.
He was one of the first people. Mm -hmm. But I was familiar with doing that, and I followed, I mean, because he and I both were in, living in Greenwich Village as children, I would say, but we were all in undergraduate school. There was another <clears> brother <throat> in the that 50s. He, there was another brother in the village that was hanging out with, with the Ginsburgs and the, the Calrex, and he's supposed to be credited as uh, actually it, 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 inventing the term um, um, uh, beat. The beat. Uh, the that might have been. That might have. Oh, that, that might have been Ted Jones. Ah, this probably was Ted Jones. Mm -hmm. Ted, the, the two major figures running around Greenwich Village in the 50s, Ted Jones and Leroy Jones. I call them the Jones boys. Okay. They were the ones who were like pushing that whole movement of the beat generation, uh, the beat poets. Fred and Getty and all those guys followed him. Followed those guys. And Ted, it was uh, Ted was interesting because he was the most mercurial. Uh, 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 not just material. Um, he was, he was the one poet who made a life on just poetry, up until the time he passed, maybe a few years ago. But by living in Africa, Europe, coming to the States maybe once a year, going back. That's all he did was poetry. He was, I mean, he, he would put the poem in his bag and go out, deliver a poem, go. And he, I mean, he was amazing. I mean, Ted was amazing. Um, but aside from that. <clears throat> what I'm talking about is language. The language of talking about what we do. Uh, one, uh, I think where it comes from, at least I begin, have begun to formulate a notion about that language coming from the spiritual or the sacred systems of Africa and, and of course how it shows up in Africa, America, the sacred performance here. I'm not saying religious religious practice. I'm talking about the sacred performance, mm. how it is performed. What are the elements in that performance? Mm. In that performance, you will have call and response. Mm. You will have rhythm and repetition. Mm. Uh, 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 I'm talking about the devices. You have testimony or other what we call testifying. Mm -hmm. So that in a play, you don't think of your play like I told, like I told you, that cast of, uh, an example, when August Wilson's play, um, King Henry, uh, King, um, 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 King, um, what's August's play, King? I don't know that one. Uh, yeah, yeah, it's a very important play. I, I mean, I've directed it, it's a wonderful, it's a great piece, it's epic. I'll think of it in a minute. Um, the third, King, um, I'll think of it in a second. You know, I, I have these lapses. No, but that's all right. I, but by the way, that's part of the, the aesthetic too. Space, uh, space and silence. Okay. So when I was doing uh, Headley, King Headley, when I was uh, yes, doing, yes. when I was doing King, what, what is, in King Headley, when they were doing it for, to, to go to Broadway, and I went to, and, and I, we were practicing, rehearsing in uh, in Chicago, and I was there, and there was a party after one of these big rehearsals, and the actors were all complaining about these long monologues, and how difficult it was to get through these monologues. My God, you know. And I, you know, I said, you know what the problem is? You people think you've got monologues. Those are not monologues. Those are testify testimonies. If you don't testify, you will never get to that. You'll never, you'll miss the rhythm of it, and you start to milk it and start acting psychological inside of it. And they're not there for psychological evaluation. You're supposed to hit that piece and go with it. You're supposed to testify. And they all show, I think, wow. Well, that's precisely what I'm saying. We miss the opportunities by not going back to the things that we, that we already do, that we already do that. And, then when, and when I did that play, the play was, on Broadway, it was something like three hours, or three and a half, three something, three and a quarter hours. When I did it, it was two and a half hours. <laughs> because they knew they they, they were testifying. Yeah. And then and it, it was galvanic. Everybody on the audience was, wow. You know, it didn't. It failed on Broadway. When I did it in a, at, at a university out in what's it, Louisville, out there with some professionals and some students, and I did it out there in the community. 
That's interesting because uh, um, there, uh, there, there was a series called Jazz, whatever. But one of the critics, one of the talking heads in that series, said the problem uh, with the problem with, 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 with music, not the problem, but the situation with uh, with jazz is that uh, we don't have a language to describe. The, the music is so far ahead of the language. Getting to that, going back to Glorious Monster and the Bell of the Horn, Larry Mills' uh, uh, piece. When I directed it, I directed it like Peter and Wolf. And it, in other words, each character had an instrument. That, 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 and, and that it makes was, sense. Like, it, was, it was amazing. That makes sense. You have to. Do, you have to. That's exactly what I'm talking about. You, that makes much more sense. Yeah, what you just what you just described. You see, also the other part that Larry talks about is the development of one's own mythologies. Not develop it, developing the mythology, but take a hold of it and use the particular mythology that belongs to you. Uh, your, 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 your life and use it. So that when he did, when he would do the, uh, 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 how do you then, you know, what is what is what is a um, a figure like uh, Muhammad Ali? Muhammad, Muhammad Ali is is like a Shango figure. You know, you've got to just uh, if you were to use the African mythologies, but then you can, or he, he or he is a benef uh, he's a bene he's a pretty benevolent, a very resourceful Mac Daddy. He's, uh, you know, in, in a cultural sensibility, mm -hmm. social cultural sensibility here. In other words, you, the language is important to, to I, I recognize, I recognize at least in almost anything that we do, whether it's painting, dancing, um, music, music doesn't acting. matter. There's always going to be what Singo refers to as rhythm, as the architecture of everything starts there. In other words, because you, it is rhythm that sets in motion, all th including with architecture, no, including anything, sets in motion the uh, uh, in, uh, uh, bringing us closer to the light of, quote, spirit. Mm. If you don't have spirit, it's, it just falls flat. So the whole idea of this, this the, the, these riffs, this kind of moving, uh, these moving parts, it's not abstract expressionism, that, that, that a lot of the, uh, the black, act, uh, black uh, uh, painters are doing. Or it is not just a question of syncopation. It's about getting the hit, the right kind of uh, orchestration uh, of sounds and mo uh, or movement, the images, to be able to create the presence of spirit. In the black church, the spirit, when they do church, when they do church, the spirit arrives in the house. And the particular text is understood. Now, it's not that they heard the text for the first time. I'm sorry, the, the particular story for the first time. They heard it several times over many years. But the story on that particular day changes and begins to bring new enlightenment about a current circumstance. And to do that, you must have rhythm and repetition. You must have call and response. You must, you must, you must set it in motion. You must have. Uh, 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 the improvisational aspects, people shout, hollering, boom, stepping up to it, and you must also be inside the mode, inside the context. You can never have a person shout outside the mode, makes sense. Put that person out. In other words, you have, to, if the shout comes, it has to be inside the riff. Mm. The same thing when, it, when, when, when the guys are playing the music, the, the, the contemporary, the very modern sound of Coltrane and those guys and young, they play it, and, and somebody would come in and they say, hey, uh, why don't you lay out on the next, Lay out it because you know you're not inside the mode. They don't yeah. mean you can't play. It means that you know you don't understand this. You don't understand what we're doing here. That's the that's the accusation they did. The Beatles did with, with not the Beatles, but the, but Yoko Ono had with the Beatles. She would just jump in and say something, and it didn't make any sense. So I, I yeah, what you're no, you can't. It, it just you can't you can't do that. No. And um, uh, in, in other words, this to say you cannot play as a musician. You, you don't have skill. It simply means you can't do this. You know, you, you know, maybe the next tune you could do, but not this. Maybe the ballad you can fall in on it. But the, no, 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 this particular thing we, we were trying to riff. So, so basically, orchestration of all of these various devices is what sets up the, what sets up the, um, uh, the aesthetic, and and also it would, it would become apparent. In, I, I mean, it's, it, it it flows from everything that we do. I mean, from oratory. From marching bands, from um, whatever uh, 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 basketball games, all about rhythm. 
Those boys lost last night uh, uh, from, from, because their rhythm was broken. Mm. That's all that was. The coach, a black coach, told his people what to do to break the rhythm of the two important shooters. And they broke the rhythm and they could not shoot. Mm. I didn't mean that they, could, they were, you know, muscled them. They broke their rhythm. Mm. When they have rhythm, they're impossible to stop. So the Cleveland Cavaliers beat uh, the Seattle, uh, Seattle uh, Seahawks, uh, Seattle Supersonics, uh, uh, because uh, they weren't in. They were. They, they didn't adhere to a black aesthetic. No, they did. No, but the Cleveland did. No. They were inside the rhythm. They said, "Do the dance." Guy did the dance. Bam. The other. I mean, I'm looking. That's why I'm looking at the game. I see the game unfolding as the, the challenge of whose rhythm is going to prevail. The rhythm, they never got into rhythm properly. Uh, what's his name? Uh, the, uh, the, the Golden State team, the Warriors. Yeah, yeah. But I'm talking about, it's in all exercises of behavior and activity that we have. You, you will find uh, when people are cooking in the kitchen, it is not, they're not, they're not, or uh, working, black folks are working, working hard. I'm trying to say just cooking, cooking a place of a, 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 a part of something. And there's a song that's going on. It's not about I just happy in the kitchen. It's about finding the particular words that you pass over the food. This is interesting because I, I, I cook a, a bit and, and, and when I used to cook and, and do these recipes and I always put I would put a, um, a music on. And then when I finished the thing and I would to write these recipes down, I would also include what music I, was, I, was, I, was, I had on. But I said, in fact, going back to, uh, to and I, I need to break here a little bit, but going back to Henry Dumas, I learned something from his widow, Loretta Dumas. What he used to do when he was writing his plays and his poems, or rather his poems and his short stories, he would put on a record. You know, in the old days we had a record, then he had the record player. He would put on a specific record and just let it keep on playing over and over again as he was working. Yeah. Yeah, I think that uh, I think that a lot of uh, uh, poets did things like that. Certainly, artists, painters. I know a lot of a lot of painters uh, would function that way. They put on a piece of music, um, to play, they might change it up at the point. A certain kind of music moves them, moves them, you know, visually. I mean, I, I've watched them in the studio uh, doing their works, and um, artists that I like very much, anyway. And that music is not inspiring them, it helps move them and galvanize them, and give them a sense of what, you know, they stay inside of that riff. Mm. You know, they're not saying, I'm inspired by it. They say that in Western tradition, Shostakovich inspired me to do so and so. No, it is not that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm.